but we are living in some crazy times. The good news I have for all of us today is that when life seems uncertain and we don't know what tomorrow holds, that our God is still on the throne and he's in control, amen? So across this place, I want us to sing this together. And how can I say it as well when my voice can barely speak? How can I sing you a song in the midst of suffering? Jesus, will you meet me here? Let your peace wash over me. And I need you now more than ever. And teach my soul to sing. Set up. That my God is still in control And still He reigns on His throne Though mountains may tremble And sea billows roll I'll sing it as well with my soul My God is still in control How many believe that this morning our God's in control? Amen?
search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough Then you came along Here in love, may sing it out. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Nothing is 
Aren't you glad that God can take any hopeless situation and help you see a way forward? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you're a God who can take a sea of opposition and part it and let us walk on dry ground. You have made a way for your people time and time again. Throughout history, God, the pages of Scripture celebrate that, and we celebrate your faithfulness, and you're still the same God. So for those who are looking, at, looking back at 2020 or looking ahead at 21, and it seems impossible to them, we pray that you'll part the waters and lead them forward. We pray that you will resurrect dead dreams and hopes, ambitions. We pray that you will show them a new path, a new way, and that, God, that you'll intervene and be glorified. For those who come with, with a heavy heart and burdens, we pray there'll be a sense of anticipation and hopefulness in place. And so we just trust you, God. Open our hearts and our minds to hear and receive from you today and that you're glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're thrilled to have you with us. We're glad to have you online as well. My bias is good to be in the room. But either way, we're just thrilled to be together. Take a moment in the room. Greet each other online. Do it with an emoji. Do it here with a fist bump or a contact-free fist bump. And then be seated. There are contact-free uh, tithe and offering receptacles when you leave today. Or you can give online or on the app or you can mail it to Little York Road. And those of you who are online watching, you can give those ways as well. And uh, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if you want a more blessed life, learn to be more generous in 2021. Not just with your finances, with your time, with your attention, uh, with your kindness and your words. To everyone in your world that God brings you in contact with. And you'll find the blessings that come back to you in that. And in December, we had an opportunity to be generous with our what if offering. What if we give? I think it was Jesus' birthday. Uh, because when it's somebody's birthday, they get presents, but Christmas, we skip Jesus. Well, at CLC, we say if each family gives an average of $250, a thousand families would raise a quarter million dollars. Uh, well, that was our what if offering to go toward Victory Project, one of the most successful, effective ministries in the city in life change. Give, them a, give VP a hand. And we gave. We'll tell you at the end of the service. <laughs> we also have guests from VP here, so you'll want to see that and you'll want to stay logged on. It's a great celebration. And uh, let me say that uh, with uh, this year, uh, our, we often start off the year with some spiritual disciplines we'll called a Daniel fast. It's from the book of Daniel, a three-week primarily vegetarian diet. Fasting is for the purpose of taking our appetites and when we feel the appetite or longing uh, to turn it into prayer. And so we've done the Daniel fast for many years. It can almost become a habit, and habits kind of become complacent. Uh, a couple years ago, we kind of missed the point, I thought, in that what was, I heard more about recipes that people were sharing than what God was doing for them and how to make great, delicious Daniel food. And the, the idea was plain diet. So uh, this year, we're going to do something different. Uh, we are going to have 21 days of prayer and fasting for 2021. I think we need it. Uh, but we're going to ask you to pray each day, and we have a prayer guide for you, a suggested prayer guide, a verse, and a direction to pray. But also we're going to ask you to fast something, and you prayerfully decide what that's going to be, whether it's the same thing the entire time. Maybe you do a Daniel fast. Uh, maybe you'll change every day. You'll, I'll do with, I'll fast chocolate. I'll fast coffee. Maybe uh, inedibles, like I'll fast streaming video. I'll fast uh, social media, whatever the case might be. Fast something every day, and when you have that hunger or that habit to turn to that. Instead, let it prompt you to pray. And online, you can go to our website or social media. We'll have daily 60-second videos uh, giving you a biblical verse and a prayer prompt, or you can pick these up in the lobby. Uh, in hindsight, it's always 2020, a healthy reset for a better 2021, and all the days that the scriptures are listed there. One of the scriptures I want to highlight is from day 18, Proverbs 14, 34. By the way, our themes are going to be praying for me, my church, and my world. And to go along with this, by the way, on Wednesday nights uh, from 7 to 8, 15 in the West Auditorium, Pastor Shane will be leading uh, a teaching and a prayer time uh, to correspond with our 21 days of prayer and fasting. So join us on Wednesday nights. It'll be a brief time of worship and then a time of Bible study and prayer with that. But on uh, day 18, Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace for any people. 
And I want to kind of double back. If there is a time we need to pray for righteousness in our nation, it's now. And uh, I want to double back to this past week. It's been a, a tumultuous week for us as a nation. And uh, Wednesday night, we had our monthly prayer and worship service. Uh, some of you were here. Many were not. And I know I personally, I was hot off the heels of watching some brief news clips of uh, a peaceful demonstration on the Washington Mall that became uh, a violent outburst and people breaking into the Capitol. One life was lost. One person was shot. Three people, I think, died from medical emergencies. And it was not the state that we would to see our nation in. I said Wednesday night that as I was grieved at demonstrations that got out of control and turned violent in the summer, I was likewise grieved over what happened, uh, people storming the Capitol building. I made a statement there that uh, I've had some questions on that I'll double back to uh, in that I saw in the scene where the Capitol was being stormed someone carrying a flag that said Jesus on it. And I objected to that saying I wish they... And I said... <laughs> I wish they wouldn't associate Jesus with the mayhem. Let me just explain it. You're going to agree or disagree. But Jesus in his life had many situations where people tried to set him up and trip him up. There was one, for instance, where they said, well, should we pay taxes or just give to the temple? That's an obvious setup. The Bible even says it was. Jesus sidestepped that, that setup and he said, well, Take out a coin. Whose inscription is on the coin? Caesar. And then he, he diverted from there. Well, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. He avoided that entrapment. My concern is, and I said back in the 1990s in a sermon series, mark my words, church, as conservative Christians, we have become, are becoming the new enemy of our culture. That is now more true than ever before. And my concern is that that photograph of a flag of Jesus in the midst of the Capitol building being attacked is going to be shown in arenas where people will then interpret that to say, see, that's what Christians do. See the lawlessness? That's Christianity for you. And so I'd rather people judge my Christianity based on my words and conversations and my deeds, not something done in a... Have that at the, at, the, at the mall, fine, the Capitol Mall. Have that there. I have a lot of friends that were there at the, at the demonstration. It wasn't even a, more of an assembly. Uh, and there are legitimate concerns, I would believe, for some of the election processes in some parts of the country. And, and so I understand all of that. But as Christians, we have to use extreme wisdom during this season of great division in our nation because we're, I am thankful for the United States of America uh, and I'm thankful to be a citizen of this country, but I am a citizen of, of a greater kingdom yet. And I, uh, I blog occasionally, and in my blog this week, I said, consider the words of Jesus that he shared on the eve of the most chaotic and troubling time in his life. It was the day before his crucifixion. When Roman soldiers would come and arrest him, he'd be tried in a mockery of a Roman court, and be sentenced to death and tortured to death. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I mentioned Wednesday night that Tuesday I was just really troubled. Didn't feel like working out Tuesday evening, so I took the dog for a late walk, late night walk. And as I was on this walk, I was trying to do as David did and encourage himself in the Lord. I was quoting scripture verses to myself that I knew out loud to kind of help peace me down. I was singing courses that would encourage me and soothe my soul. And I was just troubled. And that was before Wednesday erupted. I am concerned because I said in October that you're not just voting for a personality, more so you're voting for a party and a platform. And now that one party controls the executive branch in both houses of Congress, uh, that platform, in my opinion, is opposed to many aspects of conservative Christian biblical worldviews. And I believe we're in for a rough road ahead. And so I'm troubled. I'm troubled on my stance as a Christian, as my stance as a leader, and how to go forward. And uh, I wrote that I find I'm most troubled in life when I forget this final, unfinished promise of Jesus. 
I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. My prayer is that God will help me keep my heart focused on my final home and for me not to get too overwhelmed along my earthly journey. There's much beauty and joy and many blessings in this life, along with heartache, injustice, and pain. We were never meant to handle it all. That's why Jesus came, sent us his Holy Spirit to help us in this life, and why he promised us a better place in our eternal life. 2020 certainly helped me loosen my grip on a world I can't hold on to anyway. And a couple of scriptures that have come to mind since. In John 18, 36, Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And when I am troubled at the, the, the course and the condition of the United States of America, I have to remind myself that I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven beyond that. In Hebrews 12, 28, the Bible says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we pause to pray for this great nation of ours. Our money says, in God we trust, and we fear that that sentiment is fading fast. In fact, we know it is. We talk about being one nation under God, and there are those who want to eradicate that from our vocabulary. And we know that the United States has been used in many ways for the cause of Christ, being the greatest source of missions endeavor around the world, the greatest source of relief and compassion around the world. And God, we don't believe you're done with that. First and foremost, even through us, the Christian Life Center. So I pray for our president and his family. I pray for those who surround him. I pray for leaders in both houses of Congress, for Democrats and Republicans, God, that we would be a nation that would return to you. Righteousness exalts a nation. God, let righteousness go forth. Let evil and wickedness and dishonesty and deceit be devastated in this nation so that we can serve you in faithfulness and truth. And help each of us, Lord, to, to let our light shine brightly that people can see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. And we thank you that we look forward, God, to the day when we're in, a, in a, the unshakable kingdom of heaven for eternity. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, with that said, looking back on 2020, our weekend team said, you know, the, the popular vernacular phrase that comes to mind is dumpster fire. And so to set up the sermon series, watch this. Under heaven, 
And so some of you are sitting there wondering what the new song is. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands. I don't want to feel that old. And uh, the rest of you is kind of a nostalgic turn in church. That was Turn, 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 uh, made popular by the music group The Birds in 1965. So I was just a kid back then. Uh, and uh, the, the person credited with writing that is Pete Seeger. But if you go to the copyright information, it's kind of uh, amusing. It says, copyright, lyrics by Pete Seeger and the Book of Ecclesiastes. So they did share biblical credit. That uh, song uh, during the 60s was taken from uh, a book written by Solomon. He was a king of ancient Israel. He was heralded as the wisest man uh, of his day, uh, wisdom given by God. And uh, Solomon led the nation of Israel during really the golden age of Israel. Uh, and uh, wrote numerous proverbs, uh, wrote the, the Song of Solomon, uh, lots of wisdom statements. And he also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is, is a reflective book. Uh, it is written by a man late in years uh, with a mix of disillusionment as well. And I want to read for you uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you have your Bible or Bible device, I'm going to encourage you to turn there and read it off of that because we're going to be in Isaiah later and that's not going to be on the screen and it's verses you're going to want to, to familiarize yourself with. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's an appointed time for everything and there's a time for every matter under heaven. A time to give birth, to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And let me skip to verse 11 there. And it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. To every season, turn, turn, turn. This passage reminds us that we live in a world that is constantly changing and the condition of human life is vastly varied. And uh, I'll sort of uh, reveal for you some notes I have here. I love birth when somebody has a new baby, ha happy, healthy baby. That's my prayer for expecting couples. The idea of plant and heal and build up is all sort of preparation, anticipation. Uh, laughing and dancing, a great emotional response. Uh, the time to gather stones, it speaks about preparing for something new. Uh, a time for embracing. Uh, a time to get and keep as far as our possessions go. A time to sew together is meant a time of well-being, if you will. Things are all together. A time to speak, 
uh, speak freely, speak with those who we respect, and a time for love and a time for peace. When all that's happening, man, life is good. The problem is, you look back to 2020, just in our rearview mirror, and a whole lot of this was not the case. There was a far more time for death than sickness than we'd like to admit or expect. And there was uh, a lack of healing for many and, and laughter and dancing. I remember Joyce and I went to some friends, our old neighbors, for Christmas, uh, Christmas Day that evening. And, uh, and they, they were talk, we were talking together and their parents were in town. And the parents, when we left, said, you know, it's just nice to hear laughter again. Because there's so much despondency in 2020. And as far as embracing, well, that's something that's kind of shunned lately because of COVID. I, I don't know about you. I miss giving people hugs, uh, handshakes. Uh, getting and keeping, boy, that's uncertain. Uh, the, re the other side of this is a side of mourning. Speaking, boy, there's a lot of debate over who can speak what. And there's, a, there's far more hatred and a lot of unrest in 2020. And I would like to uh, have us consider that for those of us for whom this has threatened our well-being, as Christ followers, far too many Christians have become despondent. Far too many Christians, the downside of 2020 has got the best of them. And I think part of why it's gotten the best of them is because of our expectations and how we understand Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and the nature of life. But who am I to critique that because I'm a culture, a creature of our own culture. Let's go back a ways. Let's look at a more objective source, if you will. Uh, I want to go back a little over 100 years to uh, a young couple. Uh, this couple in particular, this photograph is from around 1907. It's their wedding photo. She's about 15. He's about 18 or 19. He was born in 1888. She was born in 1892. Their original names from Europe, his was Bollington, hers was Teddy. And uh, the last name was Penzis. You would say it in Hungarian, Penzis. And uh, he heard so many stories from a neighbor, a neighboring farm from where he lived about how great it was in America, how great it was in America, that he literally lied about his age and at 16 got an ocean lining vessel and crossed the Atlantic, came in through Ellis Island in New York and emigrated to the United States. He ended up in Cleveland, Ohio, where he, went t where he met Teddy, and their Americanized names, his name was Valentine, and hers was Teresa. Here you see they married at 15 and 19, and this couple had six children, two of which died in their infancy, and uh, the other four were my Uncle Gaza, my Uncle Louis, my Aunt Elvira, and my mom, because those are my grandparents. I know this couple as Grandma and Grandpa. Uh, met them about 60 years after the photo was taken, but nonetheless, 50 years. And uh, I learned about the death of what would have been two of my uncles uh, with my sister accidentally when we were in elementary school. We used to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house on St. Mark Avenue on the west side of Cleveland for a vacation. And uh, they lived in a duplex, a two-story duplex. They lived on the first floor. And uh, the basement was creepy. All right. They had a coal-burning furnace in there, and when you went down these wooden rickety steps, in the middle of the room was a coal-burning furnace, and along the wall were little rooms like cellars, and uh, one, the end room was the coal bin where they dumped the coal in, uh, and I remember helping Grandpa put coal in the furnace as a kid, and then somewhere in those rooms was uh, canned goods and whatnot, and in one of the rooms was always a carton of Pepsi. And when my sister and I went on vacation, our treat was we knew that one night at Grandma and Grandpa's, we were each going to get our own bottle of Pepsi. How special was that? Would you say to yourself, I'm spoiled rotten, okay? That was a treat. We didn't get that at home. The bad news to that was Grandpa would say to me, go downstairs and get a bottle of Pepsi for you and your sister. Ooh, I don't know if I want to do that, right? <laughs> I was scared to death, all right? There were monsters in that basement. And so I would run down there, and I would sing loudly to myself to build my courage. I would run, try to find what little cellar it was in, grab those bottles, and fly up the stairs. Now, the attic was a different story. The attic, if you've ever seen National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation or Chevy Chase, it was just like that, all right? Oh, you could walk on the floor. 
It was all kinds of boxes of cool stuff and trunks and all that. And my sister and I in elementary school were up there exploring one day, and we found this trunk full of black and white photographs. And we're digging through it, and we found these really old photos that would have been from the early 1900s. And, and a couple of the photographs took us back because there was a, a, a huge gathering of, I don't know, a few dozen relatives all dressed up. And they were standing on these concrete steps of this large building. And it turned out that the building was a funeral home. And in the middle of the crowd of relatives standing there was an, a small open casket with a baby inside. In those days, they took funeral pictures. And that's what we asked, what's that? Well, well, Grandma and Grandpa had two children who died in infancy. They lived quite a life. No formal education, so Grandpa worked at, on Chandler automobiles. He used to tell me that as a kid, I never looked it up until prepping for this. I looked up Chandler. Those are cool looking automobiles. Look up Chandler automobiles, all right? Here's what he did, though, all right? No education, just wanting to get a job, earn a living. And so in those days, they would paint a car, and, and when it was painted, the finish was, was, was flat. There was no shine to it. And you took a paste called rubbing compound and you would just rub it over and over and over and over and polish it with different rags until you got a shine on it. An arduous, difficult, sweaty job. He buffed out cars for a living. And then when the Chandler, when you, you could buy a luxury Chandler, top of the line Chandler for 2375 bucks back in 1922, that's pretty good. And then when Chandler had a business, he just found himself working on the different industrial floors uh, as a manual laborer in Cleveland. They lived through World War I, where 53,000 Americans lost their lives. They lived through uh, the plague of 1918 during that same time, where a third of the world was infected, 50 million deaths worldwide, uh, and 675,000 deaths in the United States. They lived through World War II, where almost 300,000 Americans died. They lived through the stock market crash and the Great Depression that started in 1929. So much so that my mom still has, makes what she calls depression meals, uh, which means you have no money, what do you do? And so it's basically code for a whole lot of potatoes or a whole lot of dumplings. That's about what a depression meal is. Uh, and uh, they lived a humble life. My grandparents, uh, later in life, my grandpa also became bivocational and was the pastor of the Hungarian Pentecostal Church in Cleveland. Uh, 50 to 75 Hungarians that eventually first-generation immigrants that died off. My grandmother had health issues throughout her life, including uh, severe asthma, got healed her from that, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and she eventually died of complications from uh, sugar diabetes in the late 1960s. After Grandma died, Grandpa, a couple years later, moved in with us and lived with us the last 12 years of his life until he was 94 years of age, and he died in 1982. They understood the joyful and painful ebb and flow of life on this planet. My grandparents would not be thrown by a time for birth and a time for death, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to heal, to kill, to build up, to tear down, a time for laughing and dancing, weeping and mourning. They, they understood that this ebb and flow, desirable and undesirable, is just part of life on this planet and their expectations of life didn't conflict with their faith. Something has happened since that couple got married in 1907. Fast forward a century later and those of us who are people of faith have a hard time managing this side of Ecclesiastes 3. I would suggest in part because we've been preached to by American Christianity at the very least, although it's got some global proponents, that if you're experiencing the favor of God and the goodness of God, there's a time to birth and plant and heal and build up and laugh and dance in preparation and embrace and get and keep and sow and speak and love and peace. That's what it's time for. Bless God. But if you look back at 2020, 2020 is really no aberration as a year from history. It's not even the worst year in history, by far. Christians have weathered years far worse than 2020 for centuries. I'm thankful for the lull in this side of the column when it does occur. 
And we've been kind of blessed and maybe even spoiled and taken for granted all the things on this side of the column. But for us as believers, this side of 2020 should not lessen our resolve, our peace, our contentment, and our trust. And verse 11 is there on purpose. He's, he's made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their hearts. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning. I'm the first one to tell you that I, while I'm a student of this book for a living, and I've got three graduate degrees, I don't understand this book. I don't understand God. I don't understand the way God works. I understand a lot of him. I understand a lot of this. But I have question marks. And I'm okay with those question marks because I'm called to walk by faith, not by figuring out. There's a lot that you can figure out about God and his, and his word and his ways. But there are mysteries that Solomon talks about there that we'll never figure out until we get to heaven, if then. And I have in my heart, as you do as well, oh, there's this sense it's not supposed to be like this. I just want fill in the blank to be over. I just want fill in the blank to be different. And there's truth to that if you say to yourself, and someday it won't be like this in eternity in the place that Jesus is preparing for me. Verse 11 reminds us God's actions are not arbitrary, they're appropriate. And the mystery of God remains on earth to yield a healthy fear of the Lord. I can't figure him out, and you know what? God is not my bud. He's my Lord. I am never more mindful of that when I go to Africa. Eswatini is the last monarchy on the continent. And you whisper the king's name. If you have an audience with the king, I don't care who you are, when you go into the king's presence, you literally get on all fours and crawl into his presence like this until he gives you permission to look at him and to speak, much less to go uprightly. There's that kind of reverence and you do it because he's the king. And with the stroke of a pen, you can have consequences to live with forever. We kind of treat God like he's at our disposal. And yet, Solomon talked about the fear of the Lord as a beginning of wisdom, a sense of, ha, ah, and who is God? A sense of not this, but this. And uh, Matthew Henry said that God never intended for the world to satisfy us here. But having placed eternity and the longing for eternity in our hearts, he whets our appetite for there. He doesn't want to, to bless you into oblivion just to get into, oh, man, just want to stay here. Let me, let me use an example. I learned last service because I just kind of spontaneous, and I evidently they I don't go to Sam's very often, but evidently they're not doing free samples of Sam's anymore, right? With COVID, bummer, right? One of the one of the few reasons I would go to Sam's, <laughs> and I will confess that I have found that if you if you know how to do the free sample circuit, you can just about get full. You know, you, you walk, you, you, you try this. Oh, thank you. Where are these at? Oh, okay. Have you ever asked where they're at with no intention to buy them? Come on. All right, 12 of us are honest enough, okay? So you walk down, and then you, what you do is you wait a little while until they forget who you are, you think, and then you go back, all right? Been there, done that proudly, all right? And they got the little, like, bacon-wrapped morsels or whatever. You don't know what the morsel is, but the bacon makes it wonderful, right? Well, those... The bacon wrap morsel is meant to make you go, ooh, I'm going to go to the freezer because I want to get more of that. How many of you have been blessed this last year? Everybody raise your hand, don't lie. Okay. 
God gives you little blessings that to heaven are little bacon-wrapped morsels. He never intends for you to say, ooh, bacon-wrapped morsels. I just want that and nothing more. The bacon-wrapped morsel that you have called a blessing is supposed to make you go, ooh, this is delicious to my soul. I can't wait until I'm there where that's commonplace. Do you understand that? Instead, we go, I just want bacon wrapped morsels. All I, want, I, don't, I just want bacon wrapped morsels. And God's like, no, it's meant to whet your appetite for there. Because on this planet, this is always going to be the case. Christian, stop being disillusioned by the nature of a fallen planet whose only solution was a savior, Jesus Christ, who took on the form of a man who died on the cross to pay for it all. I had us repeat it Wednesday. I'll have us do it again. Would you just tell your neighbor on either side, Christians don't panic? Go on. We don't. We're not supposed to. There are times I start to panic. I have to encourage myself in the Lord. I have to go to this book. I have to read the truth of God's word. I have to remind myself I am a citizen of heaven. And then the panic subsides. I have to tell you, when it comes to 2021, I wish I could say to you, I have a prophetic word from God. It's going to be great. But based on 2020 and on God's word and history, you know what 2021 is going to have? Birth and death. Planning, uprooting, healing, killing, building, tearing down, laughing, weeping, dancing, mourning, preparations, throwing, tearing apart, embracing, shunning, uh, getting and keeping, losing and throwing away, sewing together, tearing apart. And that's, then they would mourn. A sign of mourning was to rip your clothes, okay, when you lost someone. Uh, a time to speak, there'd be silence, there'd be love and hate, there'd be peace and war. In a nutshell, you can leave it going, guess what? My pastor told me biblically what's going to happen in 21. <laughs> right there. It'll happen in 22, 23, 24, and 25 until Jesus comes back. Why are we, and I speak to myself, why are we so shaken by 2020? And doggone it, we're not going to let 2021 get us that way. That'd be a good amen line right there. Like, amen, all right? And, and so let me take you to a couple of passages not on the screen. If you have your Bible device, go to Isaiah 55. Boy, I have to remind myself of this. How many cognitively oriented, figure it out problem solvers are here with me today? Let me see your hands. You're our thinker, okay? It's good news, bad news. Leaders tend to do that, all right? Different problem solving people tend to do that. Uh, it can get the best of you, being a thinker, being a problem solver. Because you can't solve it all and figure it all out. So this verse backs me off the edge. God says in, in uh, Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Stan. Neither are your ways my ways, Stan, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my ways, my thoughts, than your thoughts. Insert name here. I am called to walk by faith, not by figuring out. I've been given a mind and a brain to try to reason well and to think and whatever, but at the limits of my greatest intelligence and reasoning abilities, I will not have it all figured out. I've still got to take things by faith. Another verse in, in Isaiah, back up to chapter 40. And this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek word from God to his people who get all blown away by that. And I'm not minimizing the pain of this and the heartache of this and the struggle of this and that this isn't overwhelming, this side of the board, because it is and can be. But it need not shake me to the core of my face. Isaiah chapter 40, he says, do you not know? Verse 28, have you not heard? Like, hello? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, that guy does not become weary or tired. His understanding is perfect. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. 
Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet, say yet, yet. those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And all of us have become weary in 2020 in one dimension or another, and we're ready for a new year to be here, and now 2021 is here, and not a whole lot's changing yet. It's easy for us to get weary, but you know, even in that weariness, we can go on offense for God, for a kingdom that's not made with hands. And we decided to do that. We ended 2020, uh, one of the worst years in a lot of people's memory, we ended up saying, okay, well, how can we kind of give the devil a black eye and how can we go on offense for this kingdom that's not made with hands, that's an unshakable kingdom regardless of circumstance? And so we, we did exactly that. We said, okay, well, we know an organization, a ministry that is one of the most effective in the city in taking young men and helping them maximize the potential God's given them. It's Victory Project. And so we, we did a what-if offering and we said, what if we gave like, Jesus' birthday? We asked every CLC family, if on average 1,000 families gave 250 bucks, we'd raise a quarter million dollars to help them launch on the west side and have VP West because right now they're on Troy Street down near Children's Hospital. And they'd be praying. We believe we have a building to go into and we wanted to raise the money to help renovate that and get them launched. And rather than tell you the rest of the details, watch this. From the beginning, when I met Monty, I'm really impressed with Victory Project, which means I'm impressed with not only their staff, but with all of you. You are an incredible group of young men, and I believe that what you're doing and who you are is really a huge answer to what our city needs. And uh, you're going from what could have been a hopeless situation, not having many dreams for the future, to becoming amazing leaders and entrepreneurs and very successful people. And we're really thankful for that. Have you ever heard the saying, put your money where your mouth is? Yeah. Right? Well, we've been friends and saying to money, you want to be wind beneath Victory Project's wings. Uh, and uh, I said, when you want to expand to additional locations, we're not here to push you because God's given you and your team the vision. But we want to be part of that. And I have the privilege of pastoring Christian Life Center, an amazing group of people that have big, generous hearts. And you probably met some of those folks down here. And so we put on a challenge to our congregation. Uh, every Christmas season, we have what we call a what-if offering. And what it means is, what if we gave like it was Jesus' birthday? A couple of years ago, we set out to raise funds for a missionary partner in uh, Latin America. Our goal was $150,000. We raised about $125,000. It's still good. Last year, we only raised about $68,000 for our partner, but this year we had a really big stretch goal. And uh, we said, what if we gave, I think it was Jesus' birthday, to help Victory Project, and money came and shared, to help Victory Project uh, launch a West Dayton campus. And so our congregation dug deep and gave. We have a replica of a check that we uh, put together in our offering that is going to go towards uh, renovating a building on the west side of Dayton. So there is not only VP Troy Street, but VP West Dayton. And so it is a pleasure on behalf of a bunch of big-hearted, generous people at CLC uh, to present to you this resemblance of a check in the amount of $280,000. Which was a stretch goal, and our people said we'll do better than that. Hello, I'm Anton Fitzy, Freshman Bonus. Um, I would like to thank CLC for donating to us. We, we are really excited to expand. We're happy to have a west side and a east side. We hope to expand more and more to around, the, hopefully around the world, and get us world known. But thank y'all so much. Hello, I'm Armante. I'm Fitz. 
19, I'm a freshman, and I, uh, I want to give out a thanks to COC for bringing us this check today, and uh, hope that we expand as a group and as with um, staff also, and I just want to say thanks. CLC, I just want to send a great big thank you from uh, myself and uh, the whole, all the guys here at Victory Project. Uh, we appreciate your giving hearts. I know God says he appreciates a cheerful giver, and so do we. And so we just thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. Um, an investment in people is never a wasted investment. And when it comes to our guys at VP, uh, what lies behind them and what lies within them uh, pales to what lies ahead of them. And you're now a great part of that. So we thank you very much. Way to go, you guys. Woo, praise God. I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful I get to pastor people with a generous heart. And the difference that's going to make is huge. So we have some friends here from VP. We'll, uh, we'll start with Money Bush. Money. Thank you, Pastor. CLC, what the heck? What are you guys doing? That's an amazing, amazing gift to us. We are just blown away, honestly. We, when Pastor brought this to us, what he hoped to raise, that was a huge amount for us as an organization. And you guys just went above and beyond. So thank you for that from the bottom of our hearts. We, we are so grateful. And we have, uh, we have great plans for the future. And you guys are now uh, a part of that. And as that's happening and we're preparing for that, please come and visit us, even where we're located now. Some of you have already started to get engaged. We're 10 minutes from this building. And even when we open a second campus, we'll be like 15 minutes. So please visit us. Come and see how we're using your investment. And we look forward to uh, getting to see you personally and, and thanking you personally. So God bless. And uh, let me say as well that any money beyond what they need of that uh, to renovate the building, if it's cheaper than that to do the building, it'll go toward the first year expenses of opening VP West. So uh, we have Amante and Michael here as uh, they are team captains, right, at VP. And so we asked them to share a little bit about uh, how VP has impacted your life. So Amante, you're first. Okay, so before I start, I want to say a joke. Uh, it's a golf joke. So why do why should golfers bring two pairs of pants? Just why? in case they get a hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they're they're laughing at your joke more than mine, so you get you're doing good. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off by talking about myself. Like when I first when I first started VP, I had bad grades. Now I'm an A and B honor roll, making my mama proud. That's what I like to see. And also, I didn't know, like, it was a specific way you were supposed to shake somebody's hand. And then I came to the VP, and I learned how to shake someone's hand. And I learned how to start a weed eater more. Because, like, we work on Saturdays. So last Saturday, we, we swept out a big old house. Like, it was, it was super cold. But well, we, well, we fought through the cold and got the job done still. And uh, tutoring, that's what helped me get my grades up, study hall. And stuff like that. Thank y'all for the check. There you go. Hi, my name is Michael. How's everybody day going? That's good. That's good. Well, uh, I wanted to start off by saying how Victory Project changed my life dr dramatically. Like, so before, like, I'm gonna take about two years back to where I was in the streets. Uh, I lived like two counties, three counties away. All I did was I was in a bad shape. I was smoking marijuana. I did a lot of bad things. I didn't believe in God. Like, I didn't want to follow in God's footsteps. Everybody was telling me about it, and I just didn't believe in it. But then uh, I was put in jail. I had a two-month sentence. They put, me, uh, they put me in a foster home right after jail, and then the foster home didn't want to take me because I was in a bad shape. I didn't want to follow directions, so they put me in a group home. And then the group home just said, we got a project for you that you can go to a place called Victory Project. And they're uh, an alternative streets for America's youth. And they wanted to tell me, like, they're a, a nonprofit faith-based faith organization. They will help you with your schoolwork. They'll help you get your work ethic up. And I was like, 
I mean, like, I didn't really like it because, like I, like I said, I didn't believe in God at the time. I've been there for seven months so far, and it's probably the best thing that's ever happened in my life. And uh, <laughs> um, without Victory Project right now, I'd probably s sitting in a jail cell, probably mourning about how stupid I am. But then I'm now I'm just thinking to myself, like, I got my grades up. I'm not on probation no more. Uh, I have a lot of people that love me and care for me, and I just wanted to say thank you for your guys' donation. <laughs> well, we are so proud of both of you guys and the young men you represent. Yep. Uh, and uh, it's all about the right opportunity right, and the right place. And we just see you guys soaring, and we're just glad to be part of that. And uh, Dylan is the executive director. Why don't we hear a word from you? CLC, we can't thank you enough. We are so excited to expand our mission and continue to serve uh, awesome young men like Mikey and Armante here and help them discover the life that God has intended for them. <clears throat> These guys are leaders. They lead at VP as captains. Um, they lead in their home, and we know without a doubt they'll be leaders in their community. So we're so thankful. Uh, like Monty said, um, if, if you haven't been to VP, please come out and, and see for yourself the impact uh, that your generosity is having on us. Thank you. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want a more fulfilled 2021, learn to be more generous, not just with your money, but with your time. And I can think of a few places uh, as rewarding to spend your time as VP. And you might say, well, I'm not good with young men or what, teenagers or whatever. If you can cook... You can come out and provide a meal once a month, right? For, cook for 60, okay? Uh, but there's lots of things you can do. And so I, we're just thrilled at what this represents and uh, the new season that's opening up for VP. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for these men and for the future of Victory Project. Lord, we thank you for Armante and Michael. Pray a blessing on these young men, Lord, as you guide and direct them. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by you. Order their steps in amazing ways. Continue to bless their gift of leadership that has been shown at VP and to give them a vision for their future that you will fulfill. Bless their families, their neighborhoods through them, God. Uh, the rest of VP and all those young men that are there, God, we pray that they are world changers in their world. And Lord, we thank you for Dylan. We thank you for Monty. We thank you for all those on staff and the volunteers that are there. Uh, at VP on the east side, Lord, on Troy Street, we now pray that you will uh, work out all the details for the west side location. And that will be the first of many, Lord, as we see your ministry expand, uh, to see young men's lives changed, uh, to see their families changed, their neighborhoods changed, and this city changed. And I pray a blessing on every CLC or God who, who dug deep and gave sacrificially during the Christmas season. There are lots of excuses and reasons why not to give during the COVID year and not know what the future holds. But instead, God, I see the heart of Christ in so many who said, you know what, I wanna, I'm blessed to be a blessing. And so I pray a blessing on each one, each household. And God, help us to have an attitude toward 2021 of anticipation. Uh, it will bring both sides of Ecclesiastes 3 and you will be there in the middle of all of it. So we give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Thanks for being here. See you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Have a great week. <laughs>